have seen high adoption from 23% to 37% of the population. Uh, Ireland has been a standout in that regard. And then uh, just highlighting on the right side that, for an example, uh, Ireland has been showing that uh, users are getting notified. They are uh, who are would not be ordinarily identified through the manual contact tracing. They are getting tested, contacting public health, and uh, some are, you know, being diagnosed and detected uh, really only through uh, the exposure notification system. So again, wanted to thank you for your time. Apple and Google are, are uh, optimistic that this technology provides an additional tool uh, for public health to help fight around the world. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mike. If you could stay on for one second while I bring on the first panel, uh, the first panel is State of Healthcare in New York, Prevention and Protection for All New Yorkers. If you're on that panel, go ahead and turn on your videos and audio. Uh, we had one audience question, if you could answer it quick, Mike. Um, this app, is it available in New York? Is it something that New York is pursuing? Um, I, I think I'm deferring those questions to, to New York, uh, so. Okay, all right. Well, thank you, Mike. I appreciate yeah. the presentation. Um, and then we'll go directly sure. to our first panel. Uh, I'll hand it over to, um, Amanda Eisenberg, uh, one of New York's top healthcare reporters at Politico New York and, and a standout panel uh, to kick off the, the bigger discussions here. Uh, Amanda, over to you. Give her a second to hop on. We could always just freestyle it, John. In fact, I might. Hi, I am here. Oh, there you are. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Some technical difficulties just when I got the intro. So thank you, John. <laughs> sure. Great. Great. Um, well, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, we're a little more than six months into the COVID-19 pandemic, which has killed almost 33,000 residents statewide and left more than 70,000 people with chronic health conditions in the city alone. Black and brown communities have been hit the hardest along with the elderly, people in nursing homes, and low-wage workers. But the city is slowly recovering, thankfully. Uh, restaurants are reopening, and healthcare facilities are encouraging patients to continue seeking care. Um, and COVID-19 transmission remains low. So today, I figured we'd talk a little bit about what's coming up next. Uh, what are some big issues facing healthcare and government right now? Um, so I figured let's kick it off with Dr. Long. Um, I was hoping that you could start off with a couple of lessons that you've learned from the first wave and how the city's public hospital system is preparing for a potential second wave. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Amanda. Great question. So one of the things that we definitely learned in the public health care system was thinking back to the time when at Elmhurst Hospital, one of the initial ground zeros in the ground zero of New York City, had a line of people coming out of it waiting to get into the emergency department. That was a scary moment for them and for us. And uh, the reality was a lot of them were there for things that could have been addressed by phone. Um, and a lot of them that were there that for those reasons, it would have been better if they hadn't been going to the emergency room in the first place. As a result, we did a couple of things. We set up a, our COVID hotline, which would pair you with the clinician instantaneously around the clock. And we set up a new telehealth system for primary care that did 400,000 visits since the start of the epidemic. The, our phone line alone did 100,000 phone calls with New Yorkers, and I believe that was a critical way to keep our hospitals open, because those 100,000 people might have otherwise gone to the ED, maybe even stood in line to go to the ED, and that, uh, that changes the, the whole ballgame. So I think that was something that we definitely learned um, and would do again if there is a second surge. Second thing is, um, I think we all realize this, but just going into it with open eyes next time if there is a second surge, is that our hospitals really do become large ICUs. We tripled the size of our ICU in every one of our hospitals, all of our 11, and some of them we quadrupled the size. Uh, so I think do, pulling the trigger on that early would be a lesson that we learned um, should we have to go down that road again. And now we have a pretty good sense of how to do that. So that's a lesson that will definitely serve us very well. The third thing I would say is aggressive and effective contact tracing. 
You know, since June 1st, we've launched the Test and Trace Core and have been doing contact tracing along with the, the Department of Health in lockstep um, for uh, now more than 75,000 cases or people with coronavirus and contacts across New York City. Um, I think that's been a critical, critical piece of how we've been able to drive down the virus to arguably the lowest levels of any big city in the country at this point. Even since June, the percent of New Yorkers testing positive was 3%, and it was about 600 people or so being diagnosed every day. Now, each of those numbers since June 1st is two-thirds lower than it was then. And I think what's made the difference is every New Yorker wearing a mask when they go out there. And I think contact tracing, um, which is something that we, I think, in New York City have given our own flavor to. We hired all locally. More than half are from our hardest hit communities. And uh, collaborating between our public health care system and the Department of Health, has, I think, has been uh, one of our secret ingredients. So those are three things for me. Great. Um, and you had mentioned the contact tracing. And so this has been something that the city, you know, as John mentioned in the previous uh, interview with a new health commissioner, that this is something that kind of was a little bit of a battle between whose turf it's on between the health department and health and hospitals. Um, and with contact tracing and starting up brand new at health and hospitals, there's obviously some stumbles that you make as you're going through this process. Um, what have been, I guess, the biggest challenges and where are you hoping to take with you moving forward in terms of keeping New Yorkers informed and also gaining their trust uh, with really private and uh, important data? Mm -hmm. Yeah, biggest challenge for sure was setting up a 4,000 tracer, largest in the country organization with an IT system, a privacy system, trainings, you name it, in about two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, was, uh, that was a tall order, uh, but we did it, and we didn't do it alone, though. I mean, at every step of the way, we've been working, again, very, very closely with um, DOHMH, our uh, city department of health, and I think um, one of the things that's gone really well with that is as we've gotten things up and off the ground and as we've gotten things up and running, um, we've been able to sort of naturally get the best of both worlds. So we have hired all of the people, brought everybody on. We trained them all together. Um, my director of tracing is from the Department of Health. Um, and you know, a good example of how we've evolved is to come to our new situation room. So our new situation room we just announced, it's for, uh, to support our school reopening. Um, it's uh, on Broadway. And uh, what we have there is test and trace core tracers, Department of Health staff, sitting next to each other, doing the work completely in lockstep. Everything flows perfectly. It's, it's a great example to me of the true collaboration a city can have. Um, and I'm very confident it's going to make a substantial difference in giving our kids the best education possible. Great. Um, and you're talking about government uh, help, right? And working together to improve certain functions. I was hoping, Senator Rivera, you'd be able to jump in. I'm sorry, I got you mid-sip. Um, to talk a little bit more about contact tracing and privacy, I know you carry the bill um, that aims to tighten up some privacy concerns, and that bill is currently at Governor Cuomo's desk right now waiting to be signed. I was hoping you could kind of walk us through um, what you're aiming to get done with this bill and also your hopes moving forward as potentially more cases start to come out of the city and also the, the broader state. Gotcha. First of all, thank you for the, thank you for the invitation for today. Uh, well, th the reality is that we will not be able to get back to any level of normalcy unless we have a robust contact tracing program that continues to exist. Uh, the, you know, we've been talking about whether we talk, whether we say it's a second wave, a second surge. Uh, many folks would agree that, you know, the whole country, there's been just one wave. It broke in New York much, you know, months ago, but it is still raging in other parts of the country. And this thing is not going away anytime soon. So to be able to, uh, to, to be able to make sure that we have a, uh, that we have some level of normalcy, we need a robust contact tracing program. And the best way to do that, we believe, uh, and my, my colleague here, some member Godfrey is the sponsor of the assembly, is that we need to have that information remain private and be guaranteed that privacy needs to be guaranteed. And the thing is, number one, uh, when it comes to many of our, many of our, uh, of our uh, residents who are undocumented, or whose family are undocumented, they have already a fear, particularly with this administration in DC, they have a fear of sharing any of their information. So they want to remain hidden. And that obviously goes against 
what we're trying to do, which is trying to identify who might be have been in contact with someone else that might that that had the virus, and and so we need to make sure that that conf that that information is private. Now, I don't doubt, by the way, that the current contact tracing core in the city is doing its best to keep that information private. But the fact is that unless we pass this bill, it is not, uh, and they can't say it is. I mean, they they the contact tracers themselves cannot guarantee to an individual that they're speaking to that their information will remain private unless this bill is signed, which is why it needs to be. And, and one last bit of, of that's very important here, particularly in the, where we have many crises at the same time, right? We have a, uh, the, the public health crisis that has, been, that, that, that has hit us since March, but we have kind of an explosion as it relates to the, uh, the crisis of police violence against certain communities that has only been exacerbated by the, by, by the, uh, the, the very recent murders of Mr. Mr. Floyd, Ms. Taylor, et cetera, et cetera, that, and we just have to look at the history of, uh, of police uh, in, intervention in communities. There are folks who might not be undocumented, but still fear that their information might be used for un, for un, uh, uh, you know, not good purposes. Uh, so we want to make sure that we guarantee the privacy information so that we can get the public health effect that we're trying to get, which is why this bill is so necessary. Emily, did you want to jump in with anything? Did who want to jump in with anything? Assembly oh. oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, a couple of observations. Uh, one, before I get into that particular point, I just want to take a moment to, uh, to commend uh, the Health and Hospitals Corporation and the City Health Department. Um, you know, the terrific job they are doing on COVID uh, is a continuation of the amazing work uh, they've done for New Yorkers for Lord knows how many generations. Um, you know, I, I, I've occasionally said to people, do you remember uh, the Ebola situation in New York? And everybody goes, Ebola situation? What are you talking about? And I say, exactly. That's because the department, City Department of Health and the Health and Hospitals Corporation were on the case. And that's why nobody remembers Ebola in New York. Um, the, on, on contact tracing, confidentiality is enormously important. We learned this lesson uh, over 30 years ago with HIV when it became clear that if people with HIV or who may have been exposed were going to get tested and get into treatment and know their status, et cetera, et cetera, all of which was enormously important to saving lives, it became very clear that people weren't going to do that unless they had very strong legal protections and confidence that their information was going to be kept private. And we looked at the law and realized you know, there really isn't law that guarantees this. And so we wrote the HIV testing and confidentiality law, uh, which made an enormous uh, difference. Um, we need to do the same with contact tracing. People, certainly in this day and age of concern about the police and uh, immigration and just once your data gets out there, gets all over the place and uh, our friends at Apple and Google play a role in, 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 in that. Um, people need solid legal documentation that their contact tracing information is going to be kept under lock and key and not go to anybody other than the, than the public health people uh, who are using it strictly for contact tracing. That's what our bill does. And every day that it doesn't get, saw, get signed into law is another day that people are gonna be, continue to be unwilling to fully cooperate with contact tracing. And that means more people will get sick and die. Great, and um, Judy Wessler put a comment in for Dr. Long, and this is along those lines of involving community-based organizations, right? So we're talking a lot about privacy and trust. These community-based organizations have been working a long time in these communities, and they know the people in their community. They're able to say, hey, 
if you are going to talk to a contact tracer, like we want to make sure that it's in the best interest of public health, but also to protect you and your family for the reasons that Senator Rivera and Assemblymember Godfrey had outlined. Dr. Long, can you talk a little bit more about how community-based organizations have been working um, now that we're six months in? What has that process been like? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Um, so I'll actually give you an example of something that uh, we um, did over the last couple of weeks. So one of the things that we were noticing with contact tracing um, is that there are certain communities that were doing less testing for a variety of reasons and certain communities that had a higher percentage of people that were testing positive. Both things that are concerning that we'd want, we need to address. Um, so starting in Sunset Park and then in Soundview, we did something we call our hyper-local effort where we uh, work with community-based organizations to really get people to come out, get tested, and we do rapid testing to give you a result back within 15 minutes. In Soundview, we worked with the Mexican Coalition for the Empowerment of Youth and Families and SCO Family of Services. They brought everybody into the, our site at the library in Soundview. We tested uh, 2,600 people, knocked on 12,000 doors, made 50,000 phone calls, um, and the result of that as we were able to drive down, working together with the community-based organizations, the percent of people testing positive, we drove it down by two thirds. And if that's not cool enough, in Sunset Park, where we did a similar approach, including having in, in both locations in-person contact tracers in Soundview speaking seven languages. In Sunset Park, we drove down the percent of people testing positive, working with the community by the exact same two thirds. So for me, we have an approach working with the community that I really believe in. And I'm sharing with you now the data that's hot off the press that to me shows working with the community really does work. And it actually works incredibly well driving down the numbers in both places by the same amount, two thirds in each place. It's a great point by Dr. Long because it's very hard to manage a pandemic from a hospital system. And it really takes engagement in the community where people live, especially we don't have a cure, we don't have a vaccine. So the only way to keep people well is to do it within the community where they live. Great, and Jeff, you know, with the, the kind of work that you're doing at the hospital, can you talk a little bit more to how it's important for, you know, safety net hospitals and hospitals that primarily take Medicaid patients? Um, what have some of the challenges been like for that, ensuring that you're offering, you know, equitable care, but then making sure you're reaching these patients? Sure, yeah, thank you very much. Um, so. Uh, we serve uh, the Bronx is one of our, our key communities. And we were hit very, very hard uh, by, the, by the pandemic. We have a uh, high incidence of uh, comorbidities and, and chronic disease, which patients don't, don't uh, typically do that well when, with, with COVID-19. So it was really important to us uh, to make sure that we were doing everything we possibly could to help get uh, ahead, of the, ahead of the care for these individuals. So we partnered with uh, the governor's office and the state to open up very early on in the pandemic, the first uh, week in March, some drive up sites throughout the Bronx and the Hudson Valley to just increase access to testing. So people uh, could get a test quickly, get the result and figure out where they were. They could start quarantining themselves, keeping themselves um, at least, even if they were in the same household with their family members, they could at least do things to try and keep the spread of the disease down and keep them um, out, of the, out of the hospital. Um, we also did a number of things where um, a lot of our patients don't have really strong networks where they have the ability to, uh, for people to take care of them. So we created um, a clinic for uh, uh, post-discharge for our COVID patients. We were able to treat them after they, after they left the hospital. And so while we had a disproportionate number of very sick people in the Bronx from COVID-19, um, our outcomes uh, speak for themselves, especially so early in the pandemic. Um, and so it's just so important, again, to engage uh, with the community, make sure we're meeting patients where they are. Uh, and a key uh, tool in this was our ability to leverage telemedicine, uh, chatbot technology very early on to essentially meet patients where they were. So they were afraid to come in. We had like 70, 80% cancellation of in-person visits and they still needed care. And uh, we didn't want them to come to the emergency room. So we very quickly put up a telemedicine platform and got outreach to our patients that they could still see their physicians, they, they could still engage with their physicians and get the care they needed without having to come into a hospital or come into a physician's office. So um, it's, there's a lot of examples throughout the city of, of efforts where 
people really quickly identified the situation, what was going on, um, and acted quickly again to reorganize how we deliver care in order to get to our most vulnerable population. Great, and um, Louise, I would love for you and Ted to jump in on this because I know health and hospitals, and fa please fact check me on this, I think health and hospitals went from having 5,000 telehealth visits to 50,000 once you guys got your telehealth program up and running. And Louise, I would love for you to weigh in and kind of where primary care fits into all of this and how do you ensure care, so please. Louise, um, You know, I'll, I'll jump in. Mean, I mean, to be honest, I think primary care has fundamentally been been left outside of the 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 conversation about uh, testing and, and tracing. Um, there were some large sites, like per, certainly some federally qualified health centers, who did uh, mass testing uh, at a certain point. Um, but they also, most of them closed that down at a certain point. They really weren't getting reimbursed for it, and it was taking all of their medical providers' time. So really, it really turned out not to be a useful uh, uh, use for them. I, I do want to say, I back up, though, on this question of sort of the relationship between public health and health and hospitals with enormous respect for both organizations that I have been a part of for many, many years. I, I just wanna say though that the health department, the local health department has actually pandemic plans um, and plans for mass distribution of vaccines and for mass distributions of testing, which actually were not exercised in this, in this entire um, episode. And I do think that some of the expertise of the health department uh, was not necessarily utilized. I think that's true at the federal level. We've seen that very clearly in the last couple of days. I actually think that's true at the local level as well. And I think that actually is a, created some of the problem because one of the things that we know is that in absence of having any other place to go, people go to the, the hospital emergency rooms. You might remember in H1N1 back in 2012, um, the hospitals were being overrun with people who wanted to find out about if they were positive for H1N1. And everyone thought, well, maybe they don't have a health care provider to go, what, you know, where, what, that's why they're showing up here. And in fact, what it turned out when we asked people why they were in the emergency room is they said, we thought this was the place we were supposed to go. And they really didn't go to their primary care providers because that was the messaging they were getting. There was no messaging at the state level and there was no messaging at the local level about how you could engage with your primary care provider during this time. So in my mind, imagine this scenario. Um, this is what one nurse told me at a big testing site, that they saw 100% of the adults that they were seeing had elevated hypertension but they couldn't manage that elevated hypertension because it was a mass pass-through testing site. So really what we've seen here is a real delay of care for a lot of people and what sometimes gets called the second pandemic or a shadow pandemic, which is where we're going to see an enormous amount of, uh, of untreated uh, chronic disease, of undiagnosed chronic disease, of the lack of preventive care for other things, vaccines for flu, vaccines for children, um, cancer screenings, a number of other activities that really can't be done through telemedicine, but really are essential to making sure that the communities are, are healthy. You know, if you imagine a different scenario where you found someone found out that they were uh, negative for COVID, but perhaps they have other issues, that person then needs to access primary care. Imagine if you found out that you were positive for COVID, but you need, but, but how are you managing your care? Who's managing your care for you? We don't want the hospitals to be managing non-emergent uh, levels of care for people who are COVID positive. We need our primary care system to do that. And I think for many months, those things did not happen. And I think going forward, we really need to better engage the primary care system as a whole, not only hospital-based primary care, to make sure that the system as a whole is as robust as it can be. And someone says to them, a person coming in, you know, talks to them about their COVID issues or concerns or their symptoms, but also is dealing with a whole host of other uh, health conditions that really are going to be uh, enormously um, uh, critical to manage uh, if they get out of control. To Louise's point, we, we recognize, I'm honest, we recognize some of the same concerns that our patients weren't going to seek care. One of the things we piloted at one of our testing sites, our mass testing sites, was we offered, uh, our primary care group offered a telemedicine visit just to check in on the patient if they didn't have a primary care physician to see if there was anything that needed to be addressed. And we also went through our roles once we got past the surge and, um, and looked at all of our canceled visits and we've been emailing, calling, uh, doing different ways of trying to communicate just to let them know it's safe to come back in. We can talk to you on the phone, we can do, some, do a uh, virtual visit 
or we can, or it's safe to come back in and here's why. And we're continuing to reach out because again, to your point, we don't want that second, we want to minimize the second, the impact of the second pandemic. Yeah, just to build off of what um, Jeff and Luis are saying, all I ever want to do is a primary care doctor myself, and I, I see my patients in the Bronx and Morrisania every week, is give them what they want and what they need. And I think, as Jeff said earlier, um, get, it, telehealth has offered us an opportunity to give people what they want and need now, but it's, it's also what they're going to want to need after COVID, too. We went, um, I think, Amanda, you may have been a little overly generous with how many telehealth visits we were doing before COVID. It was low. Um, but we've had explosive growth, 400,000. But nothing, New Yorkers vote with their feet. These are people that prioritize and value the service we're offering here. And Luis, see, one of the things you said in terms of the people being diagnosed, the people in line to be tested, one of the things that really warms my primary care heart is as we've gone up and down the lines, a lot of people tell us, because we, we ask them if they have a primary care doctor, a lot of them say, no, I've never had a primary care doctor. We enroll them, as Jeff is saying, right then and there on the spot. So we're able to leverage this as an opportunity to bring people into the primary care world for the rest of their lives. And we start with telehealth. And I think my patients now tell me that when I call them on Fridays, they say they have their phone in their hand from work waiting for me to call. They don't have to take time off work. They're much happier. So I think that I completely, completely agree. This is a way to meet people where they, patients where they are with telehealth. Great, and somebody, um, Charles Francis had asked whether or not these telehealth visits are going to be permanently compensated. So CMS had said, you know, we're going to compensate a telehealth visit the same way we would do an in-person visit. But my understanding is that was kind of an emergency regulation. Um, and I know that providers have been pushing for this to become a new standing practice. I was hoping that somebody could weigh in on telehealth reimbursement, some of the struggles that the systems are having in terms of standing up its telemedicine program, but then understanding it might, you might lose money by having it. I know that, uh, one thing quickly that I'd want to say is that we're, this, is, this is one of the many things that we in the legislature are looking at uh, to, to figure out ways in which we can actually fix these things that we know have to be tweaked Either we, there's things that need to be fixed, but there's things that need to be tweaked in this new normal. And so it, it, telehealth and how we're going to deal with it going forward is, is one of the many things that we're considering as far as legislation that, that, that we're currently you know, pondering. Yeah, I, 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 would, I would agree. There's, I think there's a, there's a lot of thinking through we need to do on the question of just straight saying there will be parity for telehealth visits with non-telehealth. Uh, but I think the concept makes enormous sense. And I think the quicker we can normalize uh, much more substantial reimbursement uh, for telehealth, uh, the better. I think it makes the system more efficient. I think it promotes easier and better access to care. Uh, it has a whole lot of positives. And, and we have a large uh, government payer base and thankfully, uh, CMS, um, Medicaid, they moved some, removed some of the barriers that had held back telemedicine rollout more broadly pretty quickly. So a lot of the regulations went down. Uh, we, we were able to get reimbursed for it, which, was, which is absolutely uh, key. I think what we need is from more commercial payers, uh, payment parity, so we don't have to worry about when we see a patient, whether or not how we're going to treat them based on how we're going to get paid for it. Um, I, we also, there's lots of opportunity to expand this to other areas. So if you think what we've learned uh, during the pandemic, if we were able to monitor patients at home and provide service in their home, it would, it would cut down the spread that happens uh, within hospitals. And also we could do it, and people be much more comfortable in their homes if that's, what they're pro if that's where it is most appropriate. But right now there are barriers to, to those types of uh, payments. Things are gonna definitely evolve because um, it's, it's obviously this is going to change the way we practice medicine. I think as long as it's in partnership um, and we figure out how do we create incentives that create the most value, um, I think th this is like this could be a golden age in healthcare where we really unlock the, the value that technology has really hasn't hit this industry yet, how it's, has, it's helped other industries. You know, I think one of the things we've learned about this in this pandemic is that, you know, you can change regulation actually pretty quickly. Um, things that we thought were, you know, completely set in stone, you know, have been, we've been able to, to overcome that. I think there are a couple things, I mean, that we want to think about about telemedicine. First of all, it's, it's absolutely one of the things that I think 
people like because of all the you know reasons that you've mentioned that you can do it at your own convenience you don't have to uh, leave work uh, and so forth um, but I will say that that payment is one issue and, and there were some issues certainly early on with federally qualified health centers who were not necessarily getting the reimbursement that they needed um, certainly the the Medicare the commercial issues that you've been talking about I think the second thing is is actually though we want to think a little bit about the workflow really has to change uh, for telemedicine. This isn't the same uh, you know, comprehensive visit that you might have in a place where you might come in, a nurse might be talking to you about your medications, uh, you might be talking to a, a medical assistant who's taking your blood pressure, and then you might be talking to a, a, a physician or a nurse practitioner for 10 or 15 minutes about the particular issue that, that, that uh, brought you in, but then you'd have a follow-up with, again, someone else who might be talking to you about some other issues, including and very importantly about behavioral health issues. So there's been a lot of work in this last period about behavioral health integration with primary care. And so that's one of the things that you don't get when you have sort of this one-to-one -one on a phone together. So I think we want to use telemedicine as one of the most critical sort of mechanisms that we can have to, to have regular ongoing monitoring conversations. But it, it isn't the uh, only way that we need people to, uh, to be seen. And it actually really does change workflows. We've done a lot of technical assistance with a lot of providers. They have to really completely change how they how they work, uh, how they schedule. Um, so it's not, it's not uh, as easy to stand this up and it's not only about reimbursement. To Louise's point, you could, there's also, I'm sorry, something, Godfrey, you wanna say something? Well, I was just gonna say uh, on the question of uh, the, 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 the fact that regs can be changed uh, very quickly, <clears throat> that can be a mixed bag. Um, first of all, it depends on whether there is the will to act quickly regulations can also take forever. Uh, but also sometimes whether, sometimes you may not want regulations done quickly, uh, particularly if they're not done uh, with a lot of consultation with the people who are gonna be affected, which does happen a lot. Certainly. Good point. Um, Do you want to jump back in? Yeah, just to jump on, um, to build on uh, one, the, one of Louise's points, um, besides it, it is definitely not just about reimbursement and it, there, are, uh, there are definitely changes to the way we have to um, treat patients and then the workflows. There's also new opportunities. So if you're sitting with, typically you go see your, your primary care physician and they may recommend to go see a cardiologist, you'll get some recommendations and you'll go out and you'll try to set up an appointment, take another day off, go see that, go see that individual maybe get an EKG, maybe move your care forward. Now we, with this, uh, the acceptance of this technology, some experience with it, we have the ability to do things like link a cardiologist right into that visit, whether it's in person or it's a virtual visit. And then the primary care physician, the patient, the family, the cardiologist can connect quickly right on the spot. And so you, you're able to accelerate the, the time it takes for an individual to get care. And that's where I think reimburse, like not moving too quickly with legislation makes sense too, because this is all gonna, I think, gonna change slightly. We can use telemedicine as a really fantastic triage tool to say, mm -hmm. you know, you, maybe you don't need to see a cardiologist right away. Maybe you're, you, you're fine, let's just keep on watching it and, and we'll see, check back in six months. Or yeah, you need to go to emergency room right now, right now to get this checked out. But those are all things will change and the reimbursement definitely will not be the same to Louise's point. It's not the same visit that it was before. So there's all new things we're going to learn. And so we, I think we want to get some data, see how well it's working, and then, and then move from there. If I may chime in for one second here on one thing that, that I want to reiterate very strongly from what Dick just said. There is a need certainly to sometimes when, when there is an emergency, there is a need to change things quickly. But we have to make sure that we, this, is, this is redesigning where, you know, the governor says that we need to reimagine our health system, right? And I couldn't agree more, I rarely do with our good governor, but in this instance, I certainly do, that we need to reimagine it. Because if there's one thing that this, that this pandemic has done is shown so clearly, the parts of our systems that are broken, many of them, but if we're focusing on healthcare today, we need to reimagine it. But to do so, we must do so with patient care at its center, mm -hmm. the involvement of the actual stakeholders, and not just have it be done with just a select group of people who are just coming from one very small list that is carefully selected to just big, put a seal of approval on something that, in this case, the governor just wants done. And 
and I know we're probably going to talk about it, if we're going to reimagine healthcare, we must pass the New York Health Act. You know, I, I agree with you. I, I certainly didn't mean to say no, regulation was, was a problem overall, but really thinking about some of the sort of, there has been a lot of sort of regulatory things, maybe not so much le on the legislative side, but frankly, in the, in the so for example, in physical plant regulatory framework that is primarily there in, you know, at, at the, the state health department, we have not been able to move forward on things that would ease up the ability for primary care providers and behavioral health providers to move to, to, see, uh, to see patients in, this, in the same place at the same time. There's, there's a lot of things that are gumming up the works there. So there's certain things that I think we can, we can maybe use this opportunity though to take a, another look at and say, there were reasons why things uh, were developed in the first place. Do they still hold? Um, and then maybe not sort of put new regulations only on top of old ones, but maybe take away some of the old ones so that we can clear out some of that. But I think you're right. We want to make sure that it's done with, um, with the input of the people who matter. And that's patients or people, like all of us. And then it's providers and it's also institutions. But I think it's, it's been heavily weighted towards uh, sometimes the people who have the lo loudest voice. You know, one of the things along those lines, you know, if we're going to get into the advocacy component of this, you know, primary care doesn't have much of a voice um, nationally and in Albany. You know, we're kind of made up of different sectors. There's hospital ambulatory care, which is about a third of the, the primary care that's given. There's federally qualified health centers, which have a, have a strong voice, but they're about a third of the primary care that's given. And then there's independent primary care providers, which is another third. But we don't really have a great voice. And I think that's something that's really missing in the conversation where it really does tend to uh, have hospitals equal health care. And that's kind of one of the things I was trying to get at earlier around my point about, you know, where was primary care in this epidemic? Where, where, where did it sit? Because no one was really talking about how we were going to provide primary care providers with PPE, for example. You know, I would talk to primary care providers who are, who are competing with not only hospitals, but states and countries for PPE, you know, that just can't be. You know, we don't have a healthcare system that is really geographically focused. So no hospital said, oh, I'm gonna take care of all the people around, you know, all the organizations, you know, that are providing healthcare in my in my community, but only in my network, right? Which, which is sort of one of those things that I think we have to begin to think about. I think there does have to be some public messaging about the importance of primary care in this period. It's not only about COVID, it's actually about the other kinds of things that we need to, to have done through the primary care system, including flu vaccinations, uh, including regular childhood vaccinations, including cancer screenings. Those are all things that are critically important that are things that you know, start out at a primary care provider's office. And Louise, it seems like you know what you're talking about is a set of values, right? And oftentimes the best way to look at values is to look at a budget. And so I wanted to shift the conversation a little bit, um, going back to what Senator Rivera mentioned in terms of passing the New York Health Act and who, what stakeholders get to make what decisions. So Governor Cuomo put together his MRT2 recently to come up with different sorts of ways that the state can save money. And this was obviously when the state only had a $4 billion budget hole. Um, now we'd be so lucky to have just a $4 billion budget hole. But with the $9 billion plus deficit that we have and New York facing a variety of budget shortfalls in terms of Medicaid cuts, but then also just a bunch of other ways that the state is losing money. I want everyone to weigh in on what policy changes need to be secured um, or created to foster healthier healthcare systems, um, especially for safety net in public hospitals, but also you know investing in primary care, which to your point, Louise, is a good way to figure out people are getting sick earlier and inter intervene earlier. I know that Dick is going to jump in here. I'll do one thing quickly before he does. We need to tax the rich. We need to make sure that we get billionaires and millionaires to, to put in some money because even though it might not, we might not be able to tax our way out of it, it lessens the hit on healthcare services, on social services, on education. We must tax the rich. But I think that Dick probably has a couple of other things in mind. Well, first of all, you know, long before the COVID virus even evolved, New York was suffering from years, if not decades, <clears throat> of austerity budgeting uh, with our, our Medicaid cap and uh, the overall spending cap that uh, Governor Cuomo uh, has self-imposed. Uh, and this has, long before COVID, uh, was starving uh, 
a lot of the healthcare system, our schools, our housing, uh, transportation, a whole host of things. And the, the COVID has dug us into just a, a much deeper and deeper hole. And I don't, I, I think it's a, a fantasy to think that any, anytime soon Washington is going to bail us out of the COVID hole. They're certainly not going to bail us out of the hole we were, we had dug ourselves into long before COVID arrived. And that requires New York to confront uh, getting rid of the Medicaid cap and uh, imposing significantly higher taxes on, on ultra high wealth in New York. Otherwise, we're just going to continue heading to hell in a handbasket. And yeah, the New York Health Act, I've said for many, many years that almost every problem we face in health and healthcare is made worse and harder to solve because of the way we pay uh, for healthcare uh, in this country. And New York can make a change. COVID-19, uh, has exacerbated almost every problem in healthcare, uh, and has all of that has been made so much worse uh, by the way we pay uh, for our healthcare. Uh, there is really no way out of this deadly, literally deadly mess, uh, other than enacting the New York Health Act. You know, I'm, I'm glad I don't have the responsibility of, of figuring out New York State's budget. We'll leave that to, um, to the Senator and the Assemblyman. We, we, we'll, we're, we'll, you know, glad to work with you on that. But, but I guess I would say a couple of things. First of all, we know that primary care saves money. It doesn't save it up front, though. It saves it over the long run. And so if, you know, let's, let's just take an example. You know, we've disinvested in communities notwithstanding the fact that there are social determinants of health, that housing, education, all that, but let's take a, a community like Corona Queens, for example. It has one of the highest rates of COVID uh, infection and one of the highest mortality rates due to COVID. It also has one of the fewest number of primary care providers per population in the city. So those things are correlated. They're not, uh, they're not a direct cause, but the fact is that there's many other things going on in Corona in spite of having you know, one of the flagship hospitals there for health and hospitals and for a number of primary care providers, but certainly not sufficient to the population. We have to take the disinvested communities and actually put more money into them. And that's true you know, because of historic redlining, it's, uh, it's, you know, that black and brown communities have been disinvested in, and that's one of the things that costs us money in the long run. But I would say particularly around primary care, you know, some people have called for, you know, a Marshall Plan for primary care. I think there are four things that we need for primary care. The first one, um, to, to have primary care be there when we need it, and we needed it during this pandemic, and we will need it going forward. You know, the first one is to pay fully. You know, right now, there's a lot of ways in which the healthcare system and the insurance system puts up barriers to accessing primary care, co-pays, co-insurance. We need to pay, uh, the insurance companies need to pay fully for, for healthcare. The second thing is we need to pay quickly. You know, a lot, of, um, a lot of primary care gets paid six months, eight months, nine months after the visit itself. You actually have to move that up. Uh, one uh, health uh, insurer in North Carolina is committed to paying every bill uh, every, re every reimbursement inquest in two weeks. We should make those kinds of things happen in New York. The third thing is we have to pay prospectively. We cannot c remain stuck in this position where you get paid for the number of visits you have. You should be being paid to keep people healthy. And there are scattered parts of our healthcare system that are trying to do that, but the requirements of being able to do that really, you know, to, to prove that you've done this or that or the other thing, it really makes it impossible. We need to actively pay prospectively for the primary care that we think is needed and then pay episodically for things like a knee replacement or a shoulder replacement, those kinds of things. And then the final thing, um, and those of you who've heard me talk, you know, for the last couple of years have heard, you know, know what I'm going to say, which is that, you know, we have to pay sufficiently. Uh, primary care today gets five to seven cents on the healthcare dollar. That's not sufficient for us to have a robust primary care system that will do all the things that we want it to do and be there when we need it in times of need as, as it is today. So that's what I would suggest uh, would be the fundamental changes that we need. I think there's a whole host of regulatory and legislative activities that could uh, make that happen. Um, and we look forward to working with you all to, to do so. 
to, just to, to again, sorry. Oh, Jeff, go ahead. Uh, to, just to piggyback on, on Louise's point about uh, paying for primary care, uh, we have a, a lot of experience at Montefiore in taking risk, setting up really strong uh, primary care to, to serve our population. What, what's been frustrating over time is the models just don't exist where both the payer and the, and the provider can both benefit when they create value uh, when taking risk. We have some great examples like our, our partnership with Health First, but that's really, really where I think we can pay for primary care and create value. It's when we have those economic uh, ways of, of sharing that value and not having it rebased out the next year or the year after that, where now you just have a smaller pot that you're working with mm -hmm. as time goes on. Yeah. Great. And I would love the legislators to weigh in a little bit on some of those ideas in terms of like what they're able and capable of doing moving forward with the next, next session. Um, and also related, I have a good question from Erasmus. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Uh, the taxes are a possible long-term solution in terms of funding the New York Health Act, but what can the city and the state do in the immediate future to address the pressing needs in the communities? What are your thoughts on borrowing? On this well, one, really quickly, two, two, two quick things. Number one, uh, I, actually, I actually think that one of the things, when I'm talking about taxes, by the way, as far as taxing the ultra-wealthy and multimillionaires, that's something that we need to do now before the end of this year. So I would actually argue, yes, we can have a conversation about the payroll tax that funds the uh, universal health care that, that the New York Health Act would bring. But that's a different thing. What, when we're talking about multimillionaires, the stock transfer tax, uh, pied -terre tax, there's a lot of different options. But that would actually help us to assuage the hit that the budget cuts that are happening right now are going to, in fact, the impact that that's going to have. And I think that we need to do that first. I think that that's the most important thing because as my constituents and working class people and vulnerable folks all across the state and working class folks are suffering, the wealthier are getting wealthier, let them pay their fair share. And too quickly, bar, as far as borrowing is concerned, there, is, there, is, there are conversations right now about potential borrowing for the city. And if there is a clear plan um, that, that is presented to us, and certainly we, it seems that the conversations are happening between the mayor and the leadership in both the assembly and the Senate. Um, and if those conversations are productive and a clear plan is, pro is, is proposed that can tell us where the borrowing is actually, where the money is actually going to be used. And if it's done to avert layoffs of, of public workforces, I'm um, certainly would be supportive of that. But before we get to that borrowing, let's tax the rich. I would agree with, uh, with everything uh, Gustavo said. I would add, one more thing on the question of paying for primary care. You know, insurance companies are pretty eager to have uh, big name marquee uh, hospitals in their networks and big name uh, specialists in their networks. Because uh, when people go looking for a specialist, uh, that's when it smacks them in the face, whether uh, the cancer doctor, their doctor recommended, uh, is in network or not. And so they pay for that. Um, there's not a lot of publicity in having, uh, the, the, some of the better pediatricians in your network that doesn't bring you fame and fortune as an insurance company. And beyond that insurance companies know that if we spend a lot of money today to keep you healthy through primary care, the payoff in you being healthier down the road a few years from now, chances are you'll be the customer of a different insurance company and they will benefit from the fact that we spent money now to help make you healthier 10 years from now. So insurance companies have very little incentive uh, to invest in primary care. Uh, one of the advantages of a single payer system like the New York Health Act is that New York State as the payer will have will know that it has a permanent stake in keeping every new yorker as healthy as possible and that means making sure we invest in primary care great and so i want to just get a couple more um q a offered to you from the audience uh before we wrap up um so uh, MJ Wilson asked, has there been any discussion of passing instead of a capital gains tax, a COVID-19 gains tax for those who have prospered during this crisis? I haven't well, seen such a bill. Uh, I haven't seen such a bill, but would certainly be interested in it. 
And I think if you, you know, if you think about the quantities of money that are needed in order to put a dent in our, in our problems, which is in the tens of billions, uh, an awful lot of tax proposals that get kicked around, like, oh, why don't we legalize marijuana and tax that, which by the way, I'm in favor of, that doesn't scratch the surface in terms of the finances of New York City and New York State. Mm -hmm. Great. And then my last question, because I think this is going to be a fun one for uh, you both to answer, um, is in regards to the Department of Health conducting um, reviews or audits of managed long-term care practices during the pandemic. I was hoping you could speak a little bit to, you know, what those practices look like and what you're hoping to get out of any sort of investigation or audit on nursing homes or, or managed long-term care uh, that happened over the past six months. Well, nursing homes and, and the managed long-term care plans are, are very different topics. Uh, I think it's very clear, uh, certainly from the hearings that Gustavo and I held, uh, that uh, our for-profit nursing homes uh, do a much worse job of taking care of people and siphon off uh, an awful lot of money that ought to be used uh, for taking care of people and I hope we can pay attention to the issue of for-profit nursing homes. Uh, manage long-term care plans, uh, for years we've been working to try to make sure that the state adequately funds the managed long-term care plans, which basically pay uh, for home care, and make sure that those plans, and this is all part of Medicaid, that those plans then pay the money uh, to the home care agencies that they're supposed to pay it to, and that the home care agencies last stop on the train, pay that money uh, to the home care workers. And making sure that that cash flow uh, really happens and has enough volume and doesn't get interrupted uh, is a, an issue we've been trying to do in the legislature for some time. And as far as the hearings, and there were only 31 hours of them, not that I'm counting. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a series of uh, legislative proposals that will, be, that, will be, that will be a product of those conversations. Um, I certainly, you know, I'm thanking everybody that participated in them. And in the next couple of weeks, we'll be, we'll be kind of rolling out some of the pieces of legislation that are a product of the discussions that those 31 hours engendered. Anything you could tease for us? What's that? Anything you could tease for us on what's to come? Didn't I just do that? Like a little extra, a little more? Yeah, you know, it's uh, that actually, I'll tell you exactly. This is the bill. Somebody muted. <laughs> you got that? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I got you know we better that, Nick. <laughs> right, the good readers got it. Um, no, we're, as, as I mentioned, we're looking at. Uh, how to deal with for-profit nursing homes, how to deal with the myriad ways they have uh, to siphon money off through real estate deals and whatnot, rather than putting it into patient care. Uh, it's not going to be easy to deal with all of that, but yeah. it's, it's part of what we're looking at. If I could just say, I mean, I think there is an importance to really taking a look at the issue of you know, the state budget, but I also think just to let everyone know that, you know, the primary care sector itself might actually, uh, you know, be deeply devastated by that COVID pandemic. There's an estimate that 60,000 primary care practices may close across the country, that primary care practices have lost over um, $70,000 uh, per, uh, per provider, um, and that's not make upable. Um, so if you have a 10 provider practice, you've lost almost you know $700,000 this year that you're never going to be able to make back. Um, and that uh, and that in you know that we we actually have seen you know enormous closings. Um, so I think that remember a lot of those places. Um, that where practices are closing may not be in the hospitals, but they are in the most disinvested communities of color. And I, I just think we have to keep in mind that there's the state budget, but then there's also other uh, other parts of the economy that have really been uh, deeply, deeply distressed. That um, you know that go alongside this the state uh, the state problem. And so I think we just have to see those two things uh, together. There's many other sectors, obviously, that for the, for which that is true. But today, you know, talking about primary care. 
Great. And before, since we have five minutes left, um, I just want to make sure anyone had any final thoughts that they didn't get a chance to share but wanted to uh, mention before we wrap up. I'll reiterate, if I may, that the what right now there is there is a process, and I've said this many times over the last couple of weeks and months, actually. What this pandemic has shown us is not this does not present us with an opportunity to change these systems that do not that do not serve us. They underline the obligation that we have to do so, and the reimagining of our healthcare system has to be done in a way where we have people at its center both the folks that are the patients as well as the providers, stakeholders who actually care about not their own profit, but caring for actual people. We need to make sure, and we have, an op again, not an opportunity, but an obligation to solve these problems. There are legislative solutions. I would ask anybody to engage with us in good faith if they want to talk to us about how to do this, including our governor. And I think that this is, that this is the moment that we have to grab onto and do this because if not, in the longer term, it's only going to lead to more, more pain and death, sad, sadly. And, and we, have an we have not an opportunity, but an obligation to change these systems. This has changed. This has shown us that. To Senator Rivera's point, we can't let this crisis go to waste. We've already paid the price, right? And so now we really need to, like I said, reimagine, really think about what, what is it we need to do. And I think we now hopefully have the will to do some of the things we wouldn't have done in the past. You know, I think that the only, I mean, I agree with, with what you said, I'm going to steal the, it, this is an obligation, so I, I'm going to use that line and I'll attribute it to you, uh, Senator, at, at, at any point. But I think the other part about it is, you know, we've, we've known for a long time that there are disparities in health outcomes and health status across our communities that have to do with income, that have to do with race. Um, I think we have to move past continuing to, um, to, uh, to identify them and point them out. We now really are required to have solutions to them. And the solution is increased investment in those communities. Uh, perhaps uh, not the same amount of investment as we would have today in a wealthier community. Let us put our money in the communities that are suffering the most uh, in, in terms of the, the need for, uh, for action at this point. I think that's our obligation in addition. Well, thank you all so much for your time and answering all my questions. Senator Rivera, you tricked me. I'm not very happy what? with what are you. you talking but... about? <laughs> I was perfect. Matter of fact, I'll tell you right now. The thing is... <laughs> Got it? Got it. <laughs> all you have to do is learn to lip read. <laughs> All right, great. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you to all our panelists. Uh, we'll now go directly into our second and final panel addressing health in New York's most vulnerable populations. Again, you can hop off from the first panel, and if you're on the second panel, go ahead and bring yourself up, uh, bring in your video and audio. Uh, we're thrilled to have uh, Aaron Billups, the National Health Reporter at Spectrum News. Uh, I believe we do have everyone on who is scheduled to be on this panel. So Aaron, over to you. All right, thank you so much, John. So this as we all know, has been a year full of unprecedented health, economic, and social challenges for New Yorkers, which has led to tremendous insecurity, uncertainty, loss of crucial services provided through schools for children, increasing isolation of the elderly, and delays in much needed medical care. It is a perfect storm for widespread emotional distress, substance misuse, and psych psychiatric illness. So, how we address these issues and protect against long-term harm to vulnerable populations is what we hope to dive into with this panel. And joining me for this discussion is Dr. Hillary Cunnins, the Executive Deputy Commissioner of Mental Health uh, for the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, S State Senator Doc, uh, David Carlucci, who chairs the Mental Health and Developmental Disabilities Committee, Council Member Mark Levine, Chair of the Health Committee, and Bill, uh, Bill Baccalini, President and CEO of the New York Foundling, and last but not least, Charlotte Ostman, CEO of the Mental Health Association of Westchester. So welcome all of you. So, um, so let's get started. Uh, Dr. Cunnins, can you, can you start us off with how uh, our most vulnerable populations have been impacted by the pandemic? Sure. Thanks so, thanks so much, Erin. And, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to city and state for inviting us to be part of this today. 
Um, and, you know, as, as my title belies, um, I'm going to mostly focus on, on behavioral health in my comments, but I, uh, 